Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm uh, Rob Atkinson. I'm president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. And uh, we've got just just incredible panel uh, this morning, really to talk about antitrust, obviously a top issue, particularly in Washington, but also in Brussels. And in particular, how do we think about antitrust from an innovation perspective? Uh, that really is ITIS bread and butter. Is, is really understanding policy issues and policy frameworks from an innovation view. So we have a fantastic panel this morning who I will introduce, but I do want to announce that we're, um, ITIF is today uh, uh, rolling out its new Schumpeterian project on antitrust, the Schumpeter project that Aurelien Portus is, is leading for us. Um, and it's really, I think, a relatively unique effort to try to bring an understanding of antitrust and competition policy, uh, bring a dynamic understanding to it, if you will, or an innovation perspective to it. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about today. So I'll start with, uh, in the order that we'll go in, uh, each panelist will make about seven minutes of remarks and then we we'll, should have some time for discussion and, and questions from, uh, from the audience. As I mentioned, Aurelian is a director of antitrust and innovation policy at ITIF. He is an adjunct professor of law at the Global Antitrust Institute at George Mason University and also at Catholic University of Paris. Uh, he has written extensively <clears throat> both on US and EU competition law and economic policy, uh, including a multitude of scholarly articles and presentations at uh, international conferences. Uh, David Thies is the professor uh, in global business and the director of the Tusher Initiative of for the Management of Intellectual Capital at the Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. Uh, David has a long, long background in a whole set of issues related to this, uh, comp competitiveness, antitrust, innovation. He's worked on a, an array of different industries from the music recording industry to DRAM chips, uh, software, et cetera. And he's testified in federal and state court before Congress uh, and the Federal Trade Commission as well. Uh, Philippe Aguillon is going to be joining us uh, in just a few moments. He's a professor at the College de France and at the London School of Economics. And uh, Philippe's research focuses on the economics of growth uh, with Peter, which, by the way, you could say, doesn't all, don't all economists focus on the economics of growth? And the answer is actually very few focus on the economics of growth, which you would, if I we should find troubling, but uh, uh, Philippe's really been a leader in the space of how do economies grow? Why do they grow? What are the factors? And with Peter Howitt, he pioneered the so-called Schumpeterian growth paradigm. And that's been reflected in a number of uh, scholarly books that he's written, including Endogenous Growth Theory and the Economics of Growth, both from MIT Press. Um, Richard Gilbert is the professor emeritus at UC Berkeley. His research is in industrial organization and regulation with an emphasis on competition policy, innovation, and IP. He was previously deputy assistant attorney general for economics in the US Justice Department. Maureen Alhofson is uh, chairs Baker Botts Global Antitrust and Competition Practice, where she focuses on antitrust, privacy, and data security as well as consumer protection in investigations and litigation, uh, both in the US and abroad. And of course, uh, she was the acting chairman of the FTC, where she directed all aspects of the FTC's antitrust work, including merger review and conduct enforcement. And uh, prior to that, had also been at the commission in, in other roles. And finally, Sam Palmazano is the chairman of the Center for Global Enterprise, which is a nonprofit research organization devoted to the study of contemporary corporation and the management science of globally integrated enterprises. Uh, Sam, as you may know, began his career with IBM actually in 1973 and had a 39 year career with that company. And uh, including being the CEO for a number of years and uh, and the uh, and the uh, uh, later chairman. So um, thank you for joining us all. OK, so with that, I want to turn it over to Aurelian and um, can kick us off. 
I should also add that Aurelian uh, ITIF just released a thought piece today, sort of a framework. How do we think about Schubertarian antitrust policy? What are its outlines? What are its frameworks? How does it differ from, say, traditional Chicago and post-Chicago and also uh, what people term today neo-Brandeisian or more progressive antitrust policy? So Aurelian, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, I'm delighted that we uh, launched today uh, the Schumpeter project. So uh, today, Lina Khan will be confirmed as the next federal trade commissioner. Uh, with a Brandeisian majority, the federal trade commission will enforce antitrust in a radically different way to regulate competition and innovation in America. With Tim Hu already in the White House, it is now clear that the Brandeisian approach to antitrust prevails in government. So only a uh, few days ago, uh, last Friday actually, uh, five antitrust bills have been introduced in Congress. This is historical for two reasons. Uh, first, each of these bills, uh, if each of these bills is passed, and it's very likely, uh, it would be the first time in history when so many antitrust bills are adopted within a year. But most importantly, these bills illustrate a radical change in US antitrust laws, namely a European precautionary logic directly inspires most of the provisions in those bills. With those two events only for the last few days, it's obvious that uh, the regulation of how firms compete is about to change radically. The question is how it should be changed and why it should be changed. Bradesians have successfully criticized the Chicago School of Antitrust and have influentially advocated for the protection of small businesses against the consequence of competition. The Chicago schools focus on price and static approach, insufficiently address the challenges of today's innovation, innovative economy. But should we embrace the Brandesian turn in antitrust, or should, should we propose an alternative approach which better accounts for innovation objectives in antitrust enforcement? We believe that a more uh, innovation-centric approach to antitrust can emerge beyond the radical proposals made by Brandesians and the status quo proposed by Chicagoans. We believe that uh, a dynamic approach to competition can help antitrust enforcers better grasp the complexity of market dynamics and the disruptive innovations we see under our eyes. To articulate such an alternative approach, we aim to design an intellectual framework following the uh, seminal insights of the economist Joseph Schumpeter. Schumpeter explained how capitalism creates economic growth from changes and progress, and how these changes materialize through constant gales of creative destruction. Innovation enable, enables companies to compete uh, effectively. Therefore, not only is innovation the result of competition, but most importantly, innovation is the source of competition. Firms compete through innovation. To foster, preserve, and enhance innovation will then foster competition more than perhaps the other way around. So antitrust policy must recognize that market power is critical for innovation because it enables investments in research and development and to bring new ideas to market. Innovation-based antitrust will ensure that enforcers adopt a long-term evolutionary, in other words, dynamic approach to competition. That's what, we, that's what we need, and that's what we call dynamic antitrust. In the report we just released uh, today, we articulate those principles of dynamic antitrust if we want to take a Schumpeterian competition seriously. In the report, we advocate for change in antitrust enforcement tools and rules. Potential competition needs to be better considered in antitrust analysis. Static tools, such as market definition and per se rules, needs to be reconsidered. It's time for antitrust enforce enforcement and reforms to consider and preserve innovation incentives fully. Otherwise, innovation will deplete, competition will decline, and consumer uh, will suffer opportunity costs from lowered competition. Rather than uh, jumping in the biggest bad bundle wagon, I think we need to sit down and reflect on how we can avoid the considerable cost inherent to the emerging Brandesian approach to antitrust without necessarily sticking to the current price-centric approach. 
this is the purpose of uh, the Schumpeter project, to ensure that antitrust enforcement does not stifle innovation, but instead promote and preserve innovation as a condition to effective competition. The Schumpeter project brings together scholars, practitioners, enforcers, and industry leaders to design rules in light of dynamic antitrust. So the Schumpeter project will be active in antitrust debate, which currently take place in, in Washington, Brussels, London, etc. So now let's discuss why we need an innovation-centric antitrust. Over to you, Rob. Great, thank you so much, Aurelian. Um, so David, I'm gonna turn it over to you next. You have written so extensively on this question of how do we make sure that innovation is incorporated, partly as Aurelian said, because uh, innovation in and of itself creates competition. And oftentimes you can't see that right away, but it oftentimes occurs where we've seen this over the years. Uh, I remember famously, uh, uh, was it uh, Watson, uh, head of IBM, said that only there's only a market for three mainframe computers, uh, and, and and luckily, he changed his mind and built mainframe computers. But uh, innovation is often disruptive. So uh, over to you, David. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rob, and congratulations to you and Aurelian and others for launching this initiative. Uh, sadly, it's about 30 years too late. If you'd initiated, launched it 30 years ago, I don't think we'd be in the debacle we're in today. So, so uh, wh why is it that we, uh, we're here today? Um, first of all, the, the fundamental Schumpeterian proposition is one that I think very few people would disagree with uh, if you uh, had a discussion with them over a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. And that, uh, to paraphrase Schumpeter, it's simply that innovation is the primary driver of competition. And anybody that looks out on the industrial landscape today or even 30 years ago would say, well, of course that's correct. Uh, innovation is the primary driver of competition. That's not to say that competition doesn't also drive innovation, but it would be a natural thing to have an antitrust framework that favored innovation. The question is, why don't we? And I think the answer to that uh, is uh, found in understanding uh, economics as a field. Uh, economics has informed antitrust, uh, which is generally positive, but the problem is the kind of economics that's formed uh, has informed e um, competition policy in the last 30 to 40 years has been primarily what I call static economics. In other words, it's an economic framework that actually pays no attention or little attention to innovation. In fact, most of uh, the models in microeconomics today uh, are bereft of uh, consideration of uh, innovation and the basically equilibrium models. And in order to actually bring a Schumpeterian perspective in, you have to go elsewhere. You have to go to evolutionary economics and you have to go to complexity economics. And sadly, uh, these are very complicated uh, uh, areas of study. And so complexity economics has been largely ignored by economists and evolutionary economics has been largely ignored by economists. And the reason is not because that they don't properly characterize the world, it's because we can't model them in simple, straightforward ways. And we like to be able to model things to have confidence that we're right. Anyway, if you do have a Schumpeterian perspective, how does it change the way you look at the world? First of all, uh, you see competition as being driven primarily by economic rents. Uh, as Aurelian mentioned, uh, market definition is something uh, that is sometimes a bit too confining. Wherever there are economic rents, uh, if there's a system driven by innovation, you know, entrepreneurs will find them. Uh, so we, we shouldn't be focused on competition for market share. We shouldn't be looking necessarily at competition just within markets. We should also be looking at competition for markets. We should also recognize that firms are different. They're not all the same and that uh, they have capabilities and the capabilities, in fact, uh, impact the way in which they compete. 
And so it's very hard to have a competition policy framework that essentially reads out the role of management and leaves no room for capabilities. Firms with strong dynamic capabilities compete more vigorously than firms that don't. If you have a Schumpeterian view, and if you adopt the framework of complexity economics and evolutionary economics, then you see that performance differences between firms become amplified when there's higher levels of technological opportunity, which is, I think, what you're seeing today, the performance differences between you know, the, the big tech firms and others seem to be widening in some ways, and that's causing concern. Various companies are being left behind and some are staying on the frontier. And that's a natural consequence of a world in which there's rich technological opportunity. So, I think people are thinking, well, this is just a reflection of market power. Uh, but in fact, I believe it's a reflection of technological opportunity. So uh, properly looked at, I don't think market shares are, are high in any case because markets can't be defined in traditional ways. We should be thinking more in terms of ecosystems rather than markets. But even putting that issue to one side, uh, the performance differences that are opening up between firms have got more to do with technological opportunities and the inability of certain firms to address those uh, opportunities in the way they need to in order to succeed. Now, there's plenty of evidence in economics that would suggest that one should favor a Schumpeterian perspective and an innovation first perspective. Uh, a number of studies, uh, starting with the work of uh, Edward Mansfield back in the late 70s, have shown that the social returns to innovation are way greater than the private returns, uh, maybe in some cases orders of magnitude different or higher. So what that tells you is that innovation is the most precious uh, form of activity in our economy and that investment in innovation should be favored uh, almost uh, always uh, 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 if, if the rules of the game are set right. So we should have an innovation first perspective, even if you didn't believe in the Schumpeterian thesis, but if you just looked at the data, the spillovers from innovation that benefit consumers, they benefit suppliers, they drive higher wages, and in, in addition, uh, they stimulate further competition, there's plenty of good, solid empirical evidence to suggest that one should have an innovation first perspective. And antitrust rules and approaches that do anything to harm innovation are not just going to harm consumers, they're going to harm productivity, uh, and they're going to harm technological leadership. And this is critically important as strategic rivalry sharpens between the United States and China, uh, that if we're handicapping ourselves and holding back technological progress, uh, then we're going to pay for it in national security and in uh, uh, arguably the decline of our institutions and, and, and economic leadership globally. So the stakes here are enormously high. This is not just about competition policy. This is about uh, a broader set of issues uh, that we must not forget. Now, um, what I think we need to bear in mind is that market concentration in a Schumpeterian world is a function of two opposing forces. On the one hand, there are selection mechanisms which favor firms that are innovating, and at the same time, there's learning and imitation mechanisms which favor fast learners. And actually, to understand Silicon Valley today, you have to understand that the companies that are racing ahead, and racing ahead not because they have monopoly power, but because they have different operating models, that they've harnessed artificial intelligence, that they have made the, uh, the delivery of value to consumers way more efficient than before. And that's why they're leaping ahead. Uh, but there's a false assumption in Washington and Brussels that they're racing ahead because they've got monopoly power and they're blocking others. That's not the case, in my view. And yet there's been a pathetically small amount of research to try and understand the different operating models uh, and the role of AI in energizing these firms and stimulating their dynamic capabilities. So the fundamental, the, the, the cost we're paying here, the, because we've not 
focused in uh, inside the firm because we've not looked at the role of management, because we've not looked at business models, and because we've not looked at different operating models, we have a very poor understanding of competition. And as an economist, I think we have a lot uh, to, to, to answer for here. Uh, I think, uh, and this is almost a closing remark, but not quite, the law is actually flexible enough to take these considerations into account. Uh, but it's us economists who uh, have been wedded to static models uh, that have preferred to ignore what goes on inside firms, that prefer the world to be simple so that we can uh, talk arrogantly as if we know how competition works, uh, that our profession has uh, uh, a lot to answer for, in my view. Now, um, let me just end by saying, what does a new Schumpeterian economics look like? Well, it's one that puts innovation first. It's one that looks inside the firm at uh, differences in management structures uh, and in management capabilities. It's one that examines business models and operating models and looks for explanations uh, for economic outcomes that, that go beyond monopoly. Uh, when you don't have a proper model, and I believe it was Stigler, so Stigler or Coase that said this many years ago, when you don't have a proper understanding of things, you race for a monopoly explanation. That's what the Brandeisians are doing. They don't understand competition in the technology space. They don't understand digital economics, and they're falling back on monopoly to explain the world as they see it. This is wrong. It's very unfortunate. Uh, but it can be fixed. So thank you very much for starting this initiative. David, thank you. That was great. You, uh, you, to me, one of the key points you made is really that at the core of antitrust, particularly in the last 40 years, has been this influence of economics. And really what we're talking about is influence of neoclassical economics, which, which ha is it's, it's where innovation is exogenous. I mean, People like Paul Romer tried to make it endogenous, but it's still exogenous. It reminds me of that famous quote from Moses Abramowitz that said, innovation is the measure of our ignorance. Uh, and it still is uh, for too many people. Although I have to say there's people on this panel like Philippe who've tried to make sure that we're not as ignorant, but overall economics has not taken that into account as much as they should. Um, Richard, I was going to—I had us down as going to Philippe next. So I hope you're okay with that. Uh, Philippe, you, are you ready to kick us off for about yeah, seven minutes? I'm ready. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so Thanks. much for inviting me. I will share some slides. Share screen. Voilà. Okay. Uh, I know. Well, 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 choose what to share. Ah, what do I share now? If you go to uh, the I bottom, you'll see you'll see sh the share thing it says plus, and then share screen. Share, no, I'll stop sharing. I don't know if I could share, no, one second, I want to make sure I have my, uh, I have my, uh, alors, let me just go back, share screen again, share, how does it work, share screen, yep. uh, uh, share screen, okay, and where is my, but I don't know where, uh, what I share there, I share uh, the entire, I don't want to share the screen, I want to share my, my uh, how do I share a document? Uh, it's not like Zoom. Uh, share, share audio. No, let's, I don't know how to share this. You okay. see what I mean? Let's do this. Um, Sydney will send you some uh, some no information on how to do that, and then as you're doing that, why don't we just go over to? Oop, we lost. Or we lost to Philippe. Sorry about that, Richard. Why don't you go next, and then Sydney will communicate with um, with Philippe on how to do that. So, Richard. Again, uh, I want to uh, congratulate the Institute on the Schumpeterian Project. Uh, uh, I think there's um, a general recognition, certainly among us and many others, that uh, uh, antitrust policy should be more innovation-centric rather than price-centric. Um, and I agree with what David said in that uh, the antitrust laws, and I'll speak to the U.S. antitrust laws, I know them better, uh, are broad enough to adopt an innovation-centric approach. There's nothing in the antitrust laws that says uh, that that is excluded. Um, where I disagree with David, though, is the notion that uh, the problem is in uh, the focus of neoclassical economists on a price-centric approach. Um, in fact, there's a great deal of work 
on innovation economics. Um, uh, Philippe uh, Aguillon, Professor Aguillon, uh, uh, we just had a conference uh, uh, honoring Professor Aguillon and Professor Howard for their work, uh, which lasted four days and had, I'd lost count, probably a hundred economists all talking about uh, dynamic issues uh, and related to uh, dynamic competition issues. Uh, so there's a great deal of work. The, the innovation, uh, concentration, competition relationship has been tested uh, many times. Um, a difficulty though is that um, uh, we're still trying to understand this relationship. We don't have it entirely nailed down. Uh, and that comes up uh, as deficiencies in antitrust enforcement. So if we think about how antitrust enforcement can uh, have a role for innovation, that role could be a standalone basis for antitrust liability or a standalone basis for an antitrust defense against liability uh, or a complement. Um, now, if you look to monopolization law in the U.S., it's, it's interesting that monopolization law, uh, I think the average person who's interested in competition and, uh, and competition law would think that uh, monopolization is about effects on price. Uh, but in fact, if you look at uh, monopolization law, uh, it says nothing about price. Uh, it, it says... Uh, the question is whether there is uh, monopolization and um, uh, conduct that is not pro-competitive. Uh, if you look to U.S. versus Microsoft, kind of the you know, poster child case for uh, an innovation-centric uh, approach to, to antitrust, um, although there were many allegations of innovation in that case, uh, and it was discussed by... Uh, not just the district court, but also the court of appeals, uh, there was no actual conclusion uh, or analysis about innovation in the case. But, you know, for that matter, there really wasn't any analysis about price either. Uh, uh, it really was uh, a question of monopolization and uh, an analysis of how the monopolization was attained. Um, now, uh, you could say it should have been a broader analysis, but it was actually pretty broad to begin with. Uh, now, the, in the merger area, uh, we have a similar situation. Merger doesn't specifically say, merger law doesn't specifically say there must be a impact on price. Um, it, it's, it does say there has to be some effect on competition, and that has been interpreted as an effect on competition in a relevant market. Uh, that creates a problem for merger enforcement, for innovation, because it's hard to think about a market for innovation. This, this is one of the areas where I think we have broad agreement that we need to take a, a very, very large step back and stop thinking about market definition. Market definition is the box that, uh, uh, that the courts tend to squeeze cases in and it tends to force a price-centric approach. Uh, so if we could ease up on market definition, we could take a much broader approach. And that broad approach doesn't have to be Brandeisian, doesn't have to give up the, the principles of antitrust enforcement. In fact, I would argue that what the courts have done has been to depart from the basic principles of antitrust enforcement. Uh, you know, rather than saying, the price-centric analysis is what antitrust enforcement uh, should be about or is about. Uh, the courts have defined an approach that emphasizes a price-centric uh, uh, analysis. So what can we do if we are um, trying to bring innovation into, say, merger enforcement? Uh, well, let me think about um, uh, uh, the relationship between competition and innovation. And uh, I want to reference uh, Professor Aguillon and his uh, fundamental contribution showing that under some circumstances, not all circumstances, there can be a inverted U relationship between uh, 
let's call it uh, competition or concentration. Uh, they're both imperfect measures of what we really want to care about. Uh, and uh, the pace of innovation. Now, uh, that means it's going to peak at some intermediate level of, uh, let's just call it concentration, market concentration. Now, if markets, if you think about a merger, and if you think about a merger that would take you to a more concentrated uh, market uh, relative to that peak, then what you would expect is a slowing of innovation from that merger and also an increase in price. Uh, well, since the two go together, uh, bringing innovation into that, into that analysis isn't, prob isn't likely to change the outcome very much. What if you're on the other side of the peak so that a merger would then result in an increase in the rate of innovation, uh, but it would also likely increase the price as well. And the key issue is, is can innovation concerns uh, dominate uh, the price effects of a merger? And that, that's an interesting question, which uh, a lot of people have been studying that question. And the answer is uh, it's unclear uh, whether you can get that uh, 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 whether you can get a situation in which the innovation effects are more important from the perspective of consumers than the price effects. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, it means that either we, either we narrow down the set of issues where we think uh, innovation can really change the result, or, you know, I think some people might say, well, we should stop caring about consumers. We should look at a broader impact uh, on the market more generally. Uh, that, um, you know, I think that's an interesting question, uh, uh, which uh, uh, does not come up in a Brandeisian approach. In fact, doesn't really come up in a Schumpeterian approach either, something that we should be debating. And I'll end with that. Great. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, some really important points that we can come back to in the, in the discussion. Uh, Philippe, uh, you all set to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, uh, maybe, Davy, uh, uh, who would like to show Sydney? Maybe you would like to show my slides. Uh, you know, I worked a bit, so I, I'm totally on the same lines as uh, David and, and Richard. Uh, uh, I, so, we did some work uh, recently with Pete Clino, uh, Timo Bopart, Antonin Bergeau, Yui Lee on trying to explain the growth decline in the US. So maybe you can pass the slides. Uh, yeah, go, keep going. let's keep going to, to save time. More, 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 more. Next, 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 next. No, next, voila, that's the paper. And uh, uh, I would like first to show the first figure that comes after that. So keep going, keep going. So this, this shows you the average ra annual rates of growth over three periods. Up to 1995, post-war until 1995 in the U.S., TFP growth, average annual. Then you have the 1995-2005, which are exceptionally high years, and then the 2005-2017. Of course, the puzzle is why you had this growth decline at the time where you have IT and AI revolutions. So can we move to the next one? So in particular, you can see here that it's, it's mainly the IT producing sectors in black and the IT using sectors in green that experience the up and down of growth. And uh, uh, can we go to the next? Yeah, in, also we saw that you know, the up and down in growth was mirrored by an up and down in, uh, in employment weighted entry rate, okay? Uh, also, we saw the labor share going down and particularly faster since the early 2000s. Next one, particularly that's true in the IT producing in black and IT using in gray sectors. Then we see that in, except in manufacturing, mainly the decline in labor share is mainly due to a composition effect. It's not so much that within firms it went down, although in manufacturing it's also within firms, but it's because the low labor share firms, which are essentially the, the GAFAMs, you know, the, the, the superstar firms, got uh, expanded at the expense of other firms with a higher labor share. And uh, uh, also we see, uh, 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 you know, that the low labor share firms tend to be the bigger size firms, the firms with more plants. The next one. 
uh, and the, 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 what we saw with labor share is mirrored with markups. The increase in aggregate markups, which is a red curve, is mainly due to a composition effect, the reallocation effect, that's the black curve. It's mainly because the high markup firms uh, became uh, hegemonic and took over at the expense of the other ones. It's not so much because within firms, markups went up. So, uh, uh, and another one is that you saw the rising concentration started at the time where, uh, uh, you know, you had the growth going up and then uh, continued at the time where growth was going down. So the story we have is that when you had the IT revolution, it allowed some firms to expand much more than others. Firms that had network, social capital, they could take advantage of IT to expand a lot at the expense of other firms. And uh, in the short run, it boosted growth. That's why you have the boost in growth, 95, 2005. But then later on, it inhibited, it stifled growth and innovation and growth because they discouraged other firms to innovate because they knew they would face a superstar firm, you see what I mean, as a fringe. So that would discourage them to innovate. And that's what we saw, why you saw the decline in innovation, growth and entry subsequently. So the short term effect of the IT was to boost growth, but the long term effect is, and that's a lot because, you know, these firms were allowed to expand, to do merger and acquisition in particular, without limits. And then you exactly come to the point that Richard was making. Richard tells you, you know, that we used to, when deciding whether or not to allow for merger and acquisition, one would look essentially for market definition and market size. That's the way also the people do business in the Competition Commission in Brussels. That we never look at the dynamic effect. We never look at what will this merger stifle subsequent entry and innovation. That's what was not done. And what Richard is proposing is exactly the right thing. You want to adapt competition policy to the digital era, in particular by replacing the pure reliance on the market size and market definition on the practice of antitrust which where you, when you would decide whether or not to allow a merger revision, you would ask yourself, will it inhibit entry or not? That's much harder to do. So then, of course, I will ask uh, Richard, how will he do that concretely? How can we know uh, and how can we argue in good faith or bad faith that, you know, a merger would stifle future innovation and future entry? How can we do that practically? But if we could do that, that would be a revolution because it would, in fact, if we had done that, you know, I told Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg was eating Paris two years ago, and I told him, you know, you are responsible for the growth decline in U.S. He said, why, why is that? I said, well, because, you know, you take over everybody, and then they don't innovate. But they say, well, but they, they work hard to be taken over by me. The, the, it's true in the short run. In the short run, the prospect of being bought out by, uh, uh, by uh, <laughs> Facebook makes you uh, work harder at innovating. But once you are being uh, annexed, by uh, uh, by uh, Facebook, your incentive to innovate go down, and that's the problem. And and that's what I tried to explain Zuckerberg. He's, he seemed to be convinced by the explanation. He was very interested, intrigued. But the, the the whole challenge is what will this uh, uh, you know competition policy adapted to the digital era be? How you do concretely uh, you know know what are the criteria to know that this uh, merger acquisition will stifle innovation or will not stifle innovation? So I think that's a kind of big challenge. And then, of course, I go back, I defer to Richard, because I'm not a specialist of competition policy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, But it's true that now, you see, with, in contrast to Robert Gordon, Robert Gordon is a pessimist. He thinks that it's a fatality, that it's uh, unavoidable, that you should have a growth decline. Our way to look at things is to say, no, AI and IT have fantastic growth potential. But the, the problem is that the competition policy and more broadly institutions did not adapt to those revolutions. And that's why something that could have boost, that should have boosted growth, ends up being an obstacle to growth. So we need to find the right adaptation of competition policy to unleash the power of IT and AI revolutions. I think I'll stop there. Hello, are you there? That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Philippe. So, um, by the way, for our, our listeners or viewers, I would um, uh, we'll put a we'll put a link, hopefully, uh, to that uh, report uh, or study that Philippe did in the in the on the web page. But also, there'll be a link in there of a new report we released on Monday um, or last week. I'm sorry, I should say, where we uh, studied 
the latest census data uh, from the economic census, which uh, came out in was was a census of 2017, but the data just came out very very recently, looking at the C4 uh, ratios or the concentration ratios of about 900 six-digit industries, and while industries are not the only, uh, NAICS are not the only definition or even the best definition of industries. They tell you something. And what was fascinating about what our study found was that there's been very, almost no increase in the C4 ratios on average. The average C4 ratio increased just one percentage point from 2002 uh, to 2017. Uh, and the more concentrated industries were in 2002, the less concentrated they were in 2017. So it was kind of the opposite of what uh, sort of some of the conventional wisdom is on that. Um, so um, over now to Maureen, you've come at this really from the practitioner uh, and, and legal side, a little bit less from the economist side, but that's a critical uh, insight. So I'd love to, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Great. Well, th thanks, Rob. Uh, great to be here um, uh, with such a distinguished panel and, and such an interesting project at such a very, uh, you know, uh, important time uh, to, ha to have this debate. You know, one thing, Rob, actually I wanted to mention, I'm glad you started off with that point about the um, concentration ratios. You know, that uh, research and the Economist article really kicked off or was one of the opening salvos in this whole push to reevaluate the antitrust law in the US in particular. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting that recently the Economist had an article about the uh, decline of um, the, the uh, importance of European firms uh, and how they don't have as many uh, uh, in, the, in the big you know, le leading global firms, um, but there was no, a similar sort of frenzy to say, does European antitrust policy have anything to do with this? Uh, so, so I think uh, it may it may uh, bear some some further further inquiry. Um, so I've uh, you know I my role here is you know as an enforcer, as former enforcer, and now as a, a practitioner to try to make sense of what some of these uh, proposals and themes are, and how does one put them into a framework that is applicable, right? That That is something that, you know, you can give guidance, that decisions can be made, and that, um, you know, businesses can plan how they're, how they're going to proceed. So the, the model that has existed in the U.S. Uh, and that, that uh, currently still exists is that essentially antitrust law is supposed to protect consumer welfare. Antitrust enforcers are supposed to operate more as referees and not designers of markets. And that what we're supposed to be protecting, what there's what we're supposed to be doing is protecting competition on the mark, uh, competition on the merits, right? The, the ability for companies to compete to serve consumers better. Uh, one of the, the issues that I, that concerns me about some of these new proposals and these new discussions is it really moves away from all of these three principles. Um, we now have um, in the new bills, for example, and in other discussions, consumer interests are barely discussed, right? They're not, this is mostly about competitors, mostly about competitor access to the market, um, very little to no discussion about consumers. We might have some things about data portability for consumers, but again, that's all about facilitating uh, the ability of, of uh, other competitors to get into the market. Um, competition on the merits is doesn't really seem to be much of a discussion there. The, the idea that we wanna enable um, companies uh, to compete better and, um, uh, and designing markets, right? So we're now, moving to proposals where there are, at least for certain players, uh, but very important players, uh, um, uh, almost a utility-like model to be imposed on them, uh, which, which I find interesting because I, I don't believe that utility markets or other heavily regulated markets like that have been marked by great service <laughs> to consumers or great innovation or you know, over time. And so I, I have certainly concerns about saying that that's going to be the model that's going to um, to improve these things. 
And one of the things that I always appreciated about the current model is the because antitrust enforcers and the antitrust laws were not trying to design markets. They didn't favor one source of innovation over another. Uh, and right now, I feel like there is, we've sort of leapt ahead to this presumption that um, innovation is really only going to come from smaller players or from intermediate sized players, that it's not going to come from competition among the big, the big players. Uh, I think a lot of these bills would really greatly restrict the ability to have competition and innovation, I believe, happen by having these companies who grew up in different kind of different sectors, you know, devices and retail and um, you know, search engines and social uh, social uh, networks uh, to compete with each other. And we have seen a lot of that. When you think about you know cloud, when you think about you know video, you have a whole, a whole host of things. We've seen really a lot of competition grow uh, from, you know, competition between these or among these firms, uh, I think, to the great benefit of, of consumers. But I, uh, one of my concerns is these new proposals, I uh, seriously may foreclose the ability to do that. Uh, one of the other things, and, and I agree a lot with what Rich said, is, you know, were the current antitrust laws broad enough? Uh, to address some of these concerns. Because uh, again, there are competitive issues that can arise in markets. We want to preserve competition on the merits. We want to uh, uh, you know, be sure that, um, you, know, com that you know, competition isn't being um, squelched in a way that um, it was, is uh, bad for consumers, bad, bad for competition in the long term. But what we've taken, I think, some of the outlier issues, like for example, killer acquisition. Can a killer acquisition happen? Most, uh, you know, most certainly it was a theory. It was a, well, um, you know, uh, an issue that was uh, focused on in the pharmaceutical area um, and, you know, made, made a lot of sense there. We've seen a couple examples uh, of it. Uh, and, you know, even when I was the acting chairman, we brought, a, we brought a merger challenge based on that theory and the company expanded it. But what you see in these bills now is, is a presumption that, acquisitions by large competitors, uh, you know, these gatekeeper com um, companies, if you will, um, that all their acquisitions are, are, are killer acquisitions, that there's these um, high presumptions that they shouldn't be permitted and that, you know, they shouldn't, you know, uh, they should have to overcome these very high hurdles to, to do that. Um, and, and I'm concerned about adopting a system that says really innovation only comes through one through one channel right um, and you know we have a distributed innovation model in the US that I think has worked well I think there has been I, I know um, Philippe has some some concerns but the um, you know the ability for small players to get funding and to develop products and ideas and I, I and, you know, obviously the IP uh, based on, you know, uh, investment uh, with the hopes that eventually they would be able to exit uh, the market and continue to innovate maybe in a new product or area uh, by, by um, being bought uh, by their, their technology or their ideas or what have you being bought uh, by one of the big players. Um, I'm, I am concerned about the impacts that that might have to, to kind of shut, to shut that off. I think, um, I think the presumption that that is um, bad in all cases is not, is not is not warranted. Um, so, and again, kind of going back you now, Rob, this this may this is when I first met you a long time ago was an ITIF or a project that you had worked on called Revenge of the Disintermediated, and uh, the and it was when the, the internet really became. Uh, a medium for uh, consumers uh, to buy products. And it had upset a lot of Apple cards. And we saw a lot of push from the disintermediated, the, the, the entities that had, um, whose business model had been um, upset, looking for antitrust ways to, um, to, stop, to stop this. And I think we also need to look behind the curtain a little bit in a lot of these proposals to say who's 
interests are also being um, protected here. Because again, there's not much discussion of consumers. Uh, it, it seemed to be competitor, you know, welfare uh, models. Uh, I, I don't mean giving welfare to competitors, but trying to protect competitors. And I think perhaps we need to take a, a harder look at whether that um, is really an appropriate path to, to pursue uh, in antitrust. And maybe it is, or maybe it isn't, but it should be discussed because right now it seems to be very opaque um, about sort of the impact here. And consumers are, I think, uh, sort of being sidelined in a way that, that concerns me as a former enforcer. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. I'm, I'm that brings back a lot of memories. The Revenge of the Disintermediated. That was uh, that that was a, a, a rich playing field because there were so many companies and industries that were fighting uh, innovation and and wanted to use the government to do that. You know, your point about Europe was was, was striking. About the uh, the uh, the the Economist came out with this. I think as everybody knows, this argument and then some data showing the concentration went up. But they, I believe they were using three digit NAICS codes, uh, which is pretty worthless. But then they came out showing that Europe has lost big firms. And, uh, you know, when you don't like big firms, you tend not to get big firms. Uh, that, that seems to be the lesson from Europe. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. Um, Sam, speaking of big firms, uh, IBM, most successful innovation company probably in the world. Uh, and you were uh, you were uh, uh, the, really the, the leader of that for many, many years. You helped move IBM over into a whole set of new areas, uh, including software and services and the cloud. So um, I'd love to hear you. And what we shouldn't forget is IBM was subject, as Sam knows from I'm sure a bitter experience, subject to an antitrust case that went on and on and on and, and, and just sort of seemed like it missed the point because it, it ended up kind of all fizzling out and it, it, it didn't understand Imperterian destruction and, and new entrance. So um, anyway, Sam, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, Rob, great, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'll be more, I'll be more the pragmatist here, having been on all sides of the issues. I guess a victim, you might say, <laughs> at a point in time, and then a survivor uh, at a point in time. I'll make one comment right up front. I mean, from a Europe approach to antitrust versus the United States, Europe hates when the U.S. exports entertainment and food uh, taste to Europe, and I think the U.S. would hate the exportation of European competitive policy to the United States and just look at economic performance and having worked at all those markets, uh, I would certainly uh, short the US if that occurred. Now, let me just make two assertions right up front and I'll build a theme around those assertions. Uh, antitrust is not the answer to improving markets, growth, societal progress in a data-driven economy. Traditional antitrust is largely obsolete by today's definitions. It's, it's, it's the speed of the world, the reach, the nature of the world that we live in today is completely changed and tied to a top. We can debate the, the Brandeis or whatever, the Freeman, we can debate all those things, but fundamentally it's just not appropriate. Uh, that said, antitrust, not, you don't need to derail a company or an industry because of antitrust. Uh, if you're sort of mature and strategic in how you manage yourself, you know, companies, uh, can survive and, and prosper. Uh, you know, you, you're given a license to operate by society and you need to understand that. You need to be able to navigate through antitrust, uh, but it really doesn't free you from responsibility in everything that you do. And that's sort of an ethics and a value system that I don't think uh, ever was the case in the past. And it certainly isn't today. I mean, you need that level of responsibility. So fundamentally, antitrust is about achieving healthy markets, as our colleagues have said. And you want growth markets. I mean, society needs growth markets. I mean, we obviously understand that. Um, it was in the Brandeis Times or the Milton Freeman Time of today or Chicago School, whatever we want to argue. But it just does beg the question, which our colleagues have brought up. I think Maureen said that very well. What is the market? You know, what is the market definition? The old definitions, we there's a German model that we all lived under in this market definition and competition and share it really isn't relevant in today's world. Um, it's just completely different. And, and it's and quite honestly, it's different thanks to two meta -histo -hist historical phenomena, globalization and technology. And those things aren't going to stop just because people don't like what's happened as a result of it. These phenomena are going to continue. 
Um, globalization changes the game in fundamental ways. Let's start. There's no single enforcer anymore. There really is no enforcer in the world, in the world any longer for, uh, in any trust. There's different players have different agendas, different models. And take one of the key players in today's world, China. Uh, they distinctly have a different view of antitrust. Uh, it's running a neo-mercantile model in which corporations and entire sectors are essentially arms of the state. I mean, that's not to say China's market isn't competitive. I mean, I lived in Asia. Uh, IBM's operated in China more than a half a century. And I'd argue in many ways, it's much more fiercer competition in China and in Asia than in the Western markets. But co that competition happens within their great firewall. And, and, and not to mention with different legal regimes from the US and the EU. All of which is to say that antitrust today is even more of, but of a blunt instrument than it was in the past. And the surgery that's being asked to be performed is far more complicated than it used to be. And that's why Maureen's right when she talks about this legislation. It, it's just misguided. Um, now, what, I don't know, well, we could talk about maybe the Q&A when you do about that, but it's just misguided. I mean, the other change is technology. It has changed the game fundamentally. It's changed the game. Um, a data-driven economy is fundamentally different from an industrial economy. If creative destruction and innovation were critical to Schumpeter's, uh, what he wrote in the past, that's only increased exponentially since then. You no longer create market power by monopolizing, monopolizing production or asset scale as you did in oil or rail or steel, et cetera, et cetera. Go back to the trust busters. Today, you only create market power by creating exponential innovation, innovation that is carried out by millions, even billions of others. And that's what platform business models do. Can, as that's the question, can platform business models generate monopoly power? Sure, of course they can. Just like vertical industry trust, just like platforms to move towards scale due to build significant market power, even dominance, in certain dimensions, such as volume and quality of data ingested in their analysis. So yeah, they can create monopoly power. It's around the data point, quite honestly. Are concerns about those kinds of dominance legitimate? Yes, again, very much so but they are not effectively addressed through traditional antitrust. Indeed, platforms grow their value and influence by increasing the number of other firms they can help, and then consumers they can help, and society that they help, the number of innovation applica innovative applications they host and allow to grow. That's not what the 19th century trust did. It's not what the 20th century vertically integrated conglomerates did. The way to address, address rather a platform disproportionate impact is through, I believe, transparency of its data and analytical practices and ensuring that users control their rights of their own data and the privacy is and their privacy is protected. That's the fundamental issue here. It's uh, it is just as critical today that companies behave responsibly responsibly as it was in the past. But the answer isn't to make it impossible for new platforms to be created at scale. And and then there's this distorting, distorting impact of hyper-polarized hyper politics. I mean, let's put aside populist perennial suspicion of bigness being bad. Uh, we, we see both the right and the left wanting to break up media and social platforms because they don't like what is being published or not published as social platforms make content decisions. Look, there can be a legitimate debate about media fairness or Section 230, uh, but antitrust isn't the tool for that debate. It gets wielded for reasons having nothing to do with market optimization or growth. But, you know, OK, let's say that despite of all of that, you find yourself in the crosshairs of antitrust investigation or litigation. So that leads me to my second assertion. Now you're there. You're at IBM. We, we found ourselves in the crosshairs for a decade or maybe more, yes, you know. Uh, Rob mentioned that AT&T before us, Microsoft after us, it definitely had an impact. It contributed to our missing the shift to client server. Uh, it had a similar effect on Microsoft where initially they missed the shift to the internet. It wasn't fun, but it wasn't fatal. We managed through it. You need to think through the decision-making trade-offs in that environment. You especially need to work hard against the impulse to duck and cover, to hunker down and stop communicating or as I used to say, let the lawyers run the place. But that said, the thing that ultimately got us through this at IBM was our basic business model. I used to call it the DNA. It was basically, we were driven by innovation, as Rob mentioned. 
we were never a commodity company. I mean, we were lousy at it, quite frankly. We simply didn't know how to compete on price for low margin businesses. We, I, the ones we were in, I sold. But we did know how to invent the future. Over 100 years, we did it again and again. We went through near-term death. We bet the business transform on transformations, and somehow we came out the other side. So in that fundamental sense, there's this deep subconscious level. Uh, we weren't afraid of uh, antitrust. We knew we would be able to innovate our way out of it. Whatever the lawyers may have worried about, those of us in senior management knew that, that by the time the suit was resolved or dismissed, as it eventually was, the reasons it was brought forward <laughs> would have become moot. So some alleged that IBM had a monopoly in mainframes, and I guess Rob mentioned that uh, Watson thought there'd be three of those, right? Um, well, whether we did or didn't, it really isn't the point. We asserted we didn't. But by the 1980s, it was irrelevant. Technology had moved on, of innovation had moved on, and thankfully, so had we. And by the way, a big part of moving on was thinking deeply about what it means to be responsible in a fundamental different, fundamentally different world. Some of you may remember our model of globally integrated enterprise or vision of a smarter planet. I would argue that that deep thinking about what's responsibility in this new world today around ESG is every bit more as relevant as it was in the mid 2000s, early stages of the 2000s when we made those announcements. But Rob, thank you for your time. And it's a pleasure for me to be with you today. Uh, Sam, uh, thank, Sam you. thank you. It's, uh, it's uh, I just finished reading. I just finished as I said, reading. Before, I'm hearing uh, feedbacks. Anybody hearing that? OK, good. Sorry. I just finished reading a really good book on the history of IBM by James Cortuda, who was an IBM historian. And, and uh, James has a wonderful chapter in there of, of the sort of deleterious effect on IBM of that long nightmare, I guess, of, of having to deal with antitrust. And, and, and one of the key points he makes in that book is just how much it took the aggressive edge off of IBM. And I don't mean aggressive in a bad thing to succeed in a company. You want companies to be aggressive or assertive. And I thought it was very interesting how he, how he took his, how his argument is it took that edge off. You couldn't even talk about market share anymore in, in, in IBM business meetings. You, you couldn't talk about competitors. Uh, so there, there, sometimes we, we ignore those effects. We just assume that it has no effect on the firm other than structural. Rob, we couldn't, when I was, I was a sales manager at the time, we couldn't release a price without a legal review. Think about that in today's world, how long it took us to get a price out the door in today's world, which everything's instantaneous on the internet. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, it, it just, the, those guidelines, you're, I'm just making the point in that example, they make no sense. And so yeah. this, I mean, if politicians are mad at companies for political reasons, that doesn't mean they should destroy the economic model of growth based on innovation. Yeah. So I want to um, I want to raise one sort of broad question and then we'll jump into the questions uh, from the audience. And uh, you can just add in more on slide. Oops, sorry, if you want. So one point to me, especially when we look at the Neo Brandeisians, you know, people like Barry Lynn or Matt Stoller. Um, so it really seems to me that a lot of this debate, we, we, we pretend or we assume that the debate is what we all want the same thing. And I really am skeptical that we all want the same thing. Uh, so I think there's really three big differentiations on goals. Um, one is, is competition a means or an end? Uh, I think it's an, I think in a Schumpeterian approach, it's a means. Uh, you, you want competition because it does something for you. I think for particularly the Brandeisians, it's an ends, it's an end. And that gets to this other question of, uh, do you want, how do, how do we think about, uh, I think as Richard may, be said, how do we think about the value of innovation versus the value of price effects? And sometimes those are intention and those fundamentally can't be resolved by economic models or whatever. They're, they're really only resolved by social political dialogue. What do we value more? And then finally, this debate, I think, between, uh, if you will, sort of innovation from the Schumpeterians, small producers, uh, or as Matt uh, Stoller says in Goliath, he calls for going back to individual yeomanry. <laughs> I don't know about you, but 
I really don't want to go back 120 years to individual yeomanry, although that's where Matt wants to go. In other words, sort of glorifying small producers just for the sake of it. And then perhaps maybe Chicago, which is valuing freedom and just, you know, not having government involvement at all. So I'd just be curious, anybody, any of the speakers, what are your thoughts about sort of how much overarching political economy values uh, are important in this debate? Um, well, we got I David can, and then Maureen. Yeah, well, let me just ad address your three big points. I think I, I agree completely. If you're a Schumpeterian, you see competition as a process. In fact, he was very, very clear about that. It's not the end point. Um, and I think everybody on this panel probably agrees with that. Uh, I also agree 100% on what you said about value of innovation versus price. I mean, first, when you look around, you know damn well that it's innovation that brings prices down. Whether or not, uh, to pick up on Rich's point, you can build a model that shows that innovation dominates price, to me, is basically irrelevant. And the fact that my colleagues are wasting so much time on that, rather than looking at the real world where you see it every day, uh, is striking in terms of how we've made ourselves irrelevant. Uh, and then the last point that you and Sam were talking about, which is uh, innovation coming from the small inventor. Uh, yes, some of that's fine, but but the, the the innovation we're getting in AI is not coming from small players. Uh, it requires big data, access to big data, and, and it requires um, you know large amounts of complex data orchestration. <clears throat> and uh, we need big firms to, to, to do that. Um, and not to say that there's not a place for small firms, but it's hard to imagine uh, that we can turn uh, the world into a craft industry. Uh, it hadn't been a craft business for a long time. And on these new large technology platforms, if you're going to revert to craft, uh, you're going to revert to low productivity and low growth and low innovation. Great. Thank you. Maureen. Yes. Um, so I think one thing... Uh, kind of step back and you, Rob, you're asking about like the political economy and sort of like overall preferences of, of some of these proposals. And while the legislation, a lot of the debate right now has been focused around, you know, large platform companies. I think if you look at some of the positions that some of these uh, neo-Brandeisians have taken in other areas, it's kind of revealing about what political economy is, is actually driving a lot of this. So, uh, one of the projects that I um, had championed uh, during my time at the commission, and particularly as chair, is um, challenges about competitor control over market entry. Um, and uh, at this, at, for smaller players, the yeoman, um, the state boards, right? And this kind of goes back to the again to revenge of the disintermediated. Um, and so the idea that you had like entrenched incumbents who were throwing up licensing requirements and all kinds of entry requirements that kept small players out of the market. So you would think that, uh, you know, open markets and some of these people would have embraced that. But instead, they hated that work. They criticized it quite a bit. And I think that is very revealing about what viewpoint is really controlling this, which is, you know, I, I think a preference for, for government, you know, decisions over, over market entry uh, rather than necessarily freeing up um, you know, undue restrictions, uh, whether they're imposed by competitors or whether they're imposed by competitors pulling the levers of, of government. Uh, so I, I found that um, to be a very, I don't know, I, I thought that showed a lot about what some, uh, what some of the viewpoints, the viewpoints were driving some of those. Yeah, yeah no, that's very interesting. Uh, Richard, did I see your thumb up? You're on mute, by the way. One of the real strengths of antitrust policy for many decades has been uh, its resistance to capture. Uh, it's been the focus on consumers and welfare um, that has really avoided uh, being taken over either by large companies or by, you know, a uh, uh, conglomerate of small com companies uh, looking for protection. Uh, and that's been very successful. Uh, it is at risk now. I think it's very much at risk, uh, both through uh, lobbying by big companies and through 
lobbying by the small companies um, through the uh, legislative proposals that have been submitted uh, and, and to a certain extent on their behalf or a belief that it's on, uh, on their behalf. Uh, so I, I think that the concerns that we have, it goes both ways. Uh, certainly large companies innovate. Uh, large companies have created, uh, you know, astounding innovations that have benefited uh, so, so many of us. Uh, but it's also the case that uh, uh, that uh, economic success often brings the ability uh, both to exclude rivals and also to lobby for protection. Uh, and we got to guard against both sides of this. Great. So I want to uh, jump into the questions. Also, uh, folks, if you want to put a question into Slido, the other feature there also is you can vote four questions that you like uh, to bump them up, because I don't think we'll have time to get to all of them. But I'm gonna, um, there's a question here, really two of them that, that really come together. And, and I'm thinking maybe uh, Sam, um, uh, uh, maybe maybe Sam and, and David, you, you can maybe jump on this. And they're really both about uh, competition, competitiveness uh, and antitrust. So, how much do we need antitrust policy that's more focused on innovation to uh, beat China in the upcoming or current economic challenge? And then also uh, this issue of China. I don't think China really read Brandeis as far as I can tell. They seem to be anti-Brandeisians. Um, they, uh, they encourage big mergers, for example, in their high-speed rail industry, where my colleague Nigel Corey just wrote a big report about that. They encourage their companies to merge so they get global scale. Um, I don't know. Uh, David, you want to talk about a little bit about that or the role of... Uh, and can I say a word on this? Sure, Philip. Yeah, I just wanted on the on the high speed trains. Uh, there was a very interesting case because it shows that you know uh, what Richard says about the need to rethink anti uh, the practice of antitrust also applies to the European Commission. I mean, I think most of the time I agree with uh, you know the Competition Commission in Brussels. I think they do a very good job, and this Mrs. Vestager and all that she's to be praised. And you know, I'm not at all among those who. Uh, you know, who shoot at the competition commission. I think it's great that we have a competition commission in Europe. And most of the time, I agree with that. But there was a very interesting case study was Alstom and Siemens. You know, Alstom is a French firm and Siemens is a, it's true that Alstom and Siemens together, they monop, you know, they have, they, all the high speed trains in Europe are bought by either one or the other. It's true. So if you reason on the basis of market share, they have uh, the whole market share. But the problem is that it's a contestable market because any country could buy high speed trains from China. So they have a limit price. So you see, that's a case, you know, that illustrates the limits of a, an approach entirely based on market share. Because, you know, uh, uh, you know, you could, any, it's a contestable market, essentially, or, or almost contestable. And there is the issue of uh, does it or not stifle innovation in the high speed trade industry to have this merger? between uh, Alstom and Siemens, given particularly that on other, on signalization, for example, they were not mono, they did not monopolize the market there uh, on other brand, on other uh, parts, you know, on other segments uh, of the market they, uh, they serve. Uh, uh, so it was, a, well, uh, that was a kind of strange decision because it was not only uh, uh, argued on the basis of market share without looking at contestability. So you see that's typical, uh, I think, an illustration of the limits of the current approach. You see, they didn't look at whether it would stifle innovation or not. They didn't look at the instability. They just said market share is high, but we, we forbid. Uh, uh, so well, I wanted just to give yeah. that example. No, that's a great example. Um, and the other thing they ignored there is related to contestability is the fact that CRRC, which was a merger of two big state-owned companies, a forced merger, they're doing significantly more R&D now than Alston and Siemens combined in that market. So eventually they're going to, unless there's something structural to change, they, they could win that. So excellent point. Uh, David. Yes, thank, thank you, Rob. Uh, excellent question. And uh, here is where the Schumpeter initiative that you have can really help. We need as a nation to bring competition policy, industrial policy, and technology policy together. China does. I mean, uh, they have a different antitrust policy because it's integrated with everything else and innovation is put first and winning uh, maybe a mercantilist approach, but they've got an integrated view. 
And, uh, you know, for the convenience uh, of, 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 of regulation, we have separated uh, antitrust from technology and industrial policy questions. And, uh, in fact, industrial economists think it's anathema to raise these questions. But given that everything's on the table now, here's your chance with the Schumpeterian perspective to bring it all together. I mean, the, the horse is out of the barn already. Um, you know, change is going to come. Legislation is coming. Let's make sure we don't destroy the innovation system. Let's make sure we've got coherent technology policy. Let's make sure our technology policy and our antitrust policy are not at war with each other. And so uh, I, I think that you have the platform to do that and your own background uh, it can enable you to do it. So since uh, the, all the pottery has been broken, as, as I see it now, um, let's put it back together in an integrated way rather than you know paying attention just to political interests and, and short-term exigencies. Great, thank you. Sam. At one point on China, if I was sitting in China versus the United States, I would welcome this change in the United States. I would be cheering for it. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I would be, I mean, and they're already out investing us uh, by any measure you use in the, in, the, in, the, in the advanced technologies, AI, 5G, et cetera, et cetera, as you know. I mean, they're already out of investing us because um, all that investment's kind of been limited to the private sector and the government has prioritized you know, the, all the R&D in other spaces, mostly around healthcare. But having said all that, uh, I, I think Xi Jinping, I mean, he's got to be uh, yeah. counting with lucky stars. I mean, he's sitting there saying, man, this thing just came my way and I'm going to take advantage of it. You've created the biggest gap in the world to go become the leading economy. And he's just going to walk into that space. That's, I mean, that's how a business guy thinks, not a politician, I understand. But I would be walking in that space as fast as I could. Uh, yeah. my, could, could, could I just mention, uh, so to the point about China, when you look at these bills that have been proposed, uh, two of them actually specifically allow a foreign uh, country to challenge a merger under these laws or to um, bring in actions. So, for example, um, one of the bills that requires a lot of um, access to data and customer data and the presumption is on the platform if it tries to limit any of that, uh, specifically allows a foreign uh, entity to come in and bring an enforcement action under that. So I think, you know, uh, we, we should take a very close look at those things because to whose benefit will, will that be? I mean, we, you go back to traditional antitrust law, and yes, as a, you know, a, an entity that might participate in the market, a, a, you know, the Supreme Court had said, well, you know, a foreign country can can be, um, you know, a, a plaintiff in an, in an antitrust case, but as a market, you know, kind of participant here, um, you know, these obligations that are being considered are much, much broader than, you know, traditional antitrust law. And to directly say any foreign entity can come in and try to enforce them with all the presumptions against the platform companies, I find, you know, something that bears very close scrutiny. I mean, you're not saying that another country would try to intentionally hurt U.S. competitiveness through this process, are you? No, no, of course not. Okay, of good. I just wanted, to, just wanted to yeah. clarify. Right. Yes, clarify and we, we should all, we, yes, and there, you know, I mean, we're at a time when we have, you know, nation state actors likely behind big data hacks and big, you know, ransomware attacks. Um, maybe we should be paying a little bit closer attention to saying, what how these tools will be will be used if they're placed in their hands no exactly exactly it's interesting so i want to um there's a question there about if we had uh more of an innovation emphasis embedded into antitrust uh practice really not not so much the laws a number of you have pointed out how would we have approached the at and t um, and and ibm cases I wrote a recent piece uh, about a year ago in the American Journal of American Affairs called Who Lost Lucent, trying to explain why the U.S. had the number one and really number two with Nortel uh, telecom equipment companies in the world in the year 2000, and now we have none. And historically, antitrust played a very detrimental role. Uh, in 1925, it forced AT&T to divest all of its foreign assets, its Western Electric assets. Uh, it forced them to divest its its Canadian assets, which created Nortel. 
Um, so uh, it, it, it forced AT&T to license uh, critical telecom technology to Siemens and uh, a number of foreign Ericsson and the like in the 50s, which really gave them a leg up. But anyway, it's an interesting critical question. I'm just curious uh, anybody has any thoughts on that. David. I'll, I'll make one comment about AT&T. While, while there was some good things that came out of the divestiture, the Bell Labs didn't have to be collateral damage. It was just arrogance on the part of the competition, uh, you know, on the part of, quite frankly, Bill Baxter and co. and the DOJ. Uh, this should have been a way to preserve Western civilization's greatest research institute. Instead, it was flushed down the toilet. Uh, and that showed, you know, the ignorance of, of antitrust in a way, uh, not quite the way Easterbrook would think of ignorance, but I suppose consistent with it. Uh, you know, there was a very complicated business model uh, whereby the local uh, phone companies paid to support Bell Labs, and there should have been some mechanism to put it, uh, to preserve it. University research does not substitute for what Bell Labs did. Bell Labs was a multidisciplinary institution. You know, IBM Labs is, is similar uh, and one of the few, and we're lacking this capability nationally. Uh, throwing more money at universities and government research labs won't bring back uh, the old Bell Labs or anything close to it. And uh, uh, that's, that's unfortunate. So once again, the innovation lens uh, uh, was, was not around. Uh, well, it was around, but it was applied in a very narrow way with respect to the divestiture, and it was unnecessarily unnecessary collateral damage to take out Bell Labs, in my view. Yeah, before, Cham, you jump in on that, David, do you, do your other point about in the U.S. government, was interesting about that history is the biggest opponents to that were uh, in the government were the Department of Commerce and the Department of Defense. They both actively opposed that breakup the way it was done, right. uh, but, but they couldn't, they didn't have enough power vis-a-vis -vis DOJ. Uh, Sam? Yeah, just I'll build on David's point from a business, how you would think about it economically. If you go back to one of our colleagues was saying that, oh, uh, that Richard, maybe that the idea of today's innovation, these advanced technology require large data sets and significant investment to advance the technology. Also, 5G, put them all together, cloud, 5G, AI, big data, you throw them all together, it requires large resource pools. And you break these companies up, you go from a large, you're AT&T, you broke out the baby bills. You went from a large economic source because you fund somewhere between IBM's case, six or 7% of revenue in the R&D model that made it a six or $7 billion a year, you know, a hundred billion dollar company, not complicated, right? You're going to knock it down to a couple of billions. So all these things that require scale, you're economically, you're going to shrink over time. You're going to do what they did to AT&T Bell Labs to everybody else, Right. That's what's going to happen. Now, of course, we understand that the people that are crafting this legislation have no understanding, which I think, Rob, why you have such a big role here, understanding of the implications of what they're designing. And IT, I, I really believe you guys can help them at least understand the implications <coughs> of where they're going with this, with this path. I mean, as a competitor, go back to my old world. If I was competing with Google or any of these guys or Facebook, I'd love this, by the way. Absolutely. If I was Oracle in the Microsoft suit, who liked it the best? Larry Ellison, right? I mean, that's that's how the world works, guys. Contrary, yeah, well, can I add contrary to political belief, right? If I may add uh, another yeah. issue, and I think it's related to both uh, what Sam and David said, is that antitrust enforcement tends to focus <clears throat> on liability and not on the actual fix. Uh, and so if you look at the AT&T uh, divestiture, uh, the line of business restrictions were a nightmare and continue to be a nightmare for, for what, 20 years or something until legislation finally came in and for better or worse, uh, you know, uh, avoided that problem. Uh, and you see the same thing now. A good example, I think, is the Google search case at the, in the European Union, where they came up with a decision about what Google should, shouldn't be doing. Uh, and they never, well, actually, the decision said what Google should be doing, and they never figured out what they should not be doing. And that remedy languished for years as well. And so we need to think about how to fix these things, not just how to decide whether they're lawful or unlawful. 
Yeah, and sometimes the fix is related to antitrust, and sometimes it's related to other kinds of tools uh, and policies. Um, I, I see that now with this, this conflation of privacy and antitrust. Well, we all have a privacy problem, so we'll break up technology companies. And explain to me why that would have any effect on, on privacy as opposed to a national privacy bill. I want to switch over. There's an interesting question about IP, which we haven't talked about. In a, in a sort of idealized Brandeisian world, you, you not only want aggressive antitrust to break up lots of companies, but you don't want very strong IP because IP in, is, a, is a government grant of monopoly, if you will. Uh, it's a government grant of market power in order to incent innovation. So I'm just curious, what's the relationship in a Schubertarian um, model? Uh, Philippe, <clears throat> you're on mute now, Philippe. Philippe, you're on mute. I, 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 yeah, sorry for that. yeah, usually something, a kind of very, uh, you know, primitive view would see IP as antinomic to competition. Whenever you want IP, you want less competition. But in fact, if you reason in a model with step-by-step -step innovation, uh, you can see right away that there are complementary instruments. Uh, uh, competition, uh, more competition will induce you to innovate more to escape competition. And IP will increase the reward if you succeed. So competition will increase the punishment if you fail to innovate. And IP will increase the reward if you succeed to innovate. So in fact, if those are the two are complementary. And I did some empirical work with Howitt uh, and Suzanne Prentel in the Journal of Economic Growth, where we show that indeed there is complementarity between IP and competition policy. They are not antinomic, they are complementary because one raises the reward if you innovate, and the other one raises the punishment if you don't. And they are, you see, in the, in the, at least in the same, on the suitable parameter values, you, and, and in the data, you find the complementarity. But it's true that some people had the, the, this prior view because they would only think that the, the, the return from innovating is the post-innovation return, but it is the difference between the post-innovation and the pre-innovation. And uh, the competition reduces the pre-innovation rate whereas IP raises the post-innovation, right? and both contribute to raising the difference. And that's, uh, that's the thing that you know, very, uh, some people miss uh, in, uh, when discussing this. I wanted just to make that, uh, that comment. So I think if I, had, if I could wave a magic wand and have people understand one thing about a competition and innovation, it would be uh, Philippe's inverted U. <clears throat> Because so many, <clears throat> at least the Brandeisians believe it's a negative line. Uh, more competition means more innovation. And at some point it does uh, mean that. And at other points it means the opposite. And your scholarly work, as well as a few others, have really made that clear. And, and I think that's really one of the key points about our project is it's not, it's not in some way a libertarian project that there shouldn't be antitrust enforcement or that somehow the, uh, let anybody do whatever they want. It, it's really to say, let's be careful, let's be strategic, let's really incorporate uh, dynamic effects. So I wanna just go around and ask each person, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let Aurelian have the final word, but just sort of 30 seconds or less, uh, just closing thoughts. Uh, I'll start, Philippe, with you, uh, since I see you in my upper left corner. Um, no, but look, I think you've said it. I mean, uh, I'm very happy, you know, that uh, innovation and competition are brought together, that we go beyond the pure market share, market definition. I'm completely in line with Richard and with uh, saying, you know, you have to put innovation into the, into the debate and, and see how you, uh, you know, and competition is, of course, a mean. It's a mean to achieve uh, more uh, productivity growth. Uh, combined with other suitable policies, also mean to achieve greener growth. You know, for example, I've done recent work that show that, you know, when you are in countries where you have pro-environmental values, a competition policy uh, uh, helps go innovate greener because uh, to escape competition, you, you know, uh, you will, you will in and to attract consumers, you will tend to innovate greener in greener technology. In the absence of competition, you wouldn't as much. So competition is a fantastic force not only to get more innovation, but to get the right type of innovation, provided you know consumers have the right kind of preferences, which that you can influence through uh, you know the, with the media, through education, through. Uh, uh, but it's amazing, uh, you know. Carbon price has been advocated like a big instrument. It's it's an important one, but competition is as important as carbon price to induce firms to innovate greener. We didn't talk about this today. But it's a big deal now in. Uh, 
uh, and it's again the escape competition effect that that's at work. Yeah, that's uh, I couldn't agree more. That's why ITIF has had a it's clean energy innovation project for about three or four years now, really focusing on the innovation side, which uh, oftentimes gets left behind. Uh, Richard. You know, I believe that uh, almost everything is described by an inverted U. Uh, <laughs> and unfortunately, too many people don't follow that uh, prescription. You know, there are people who think that uh, the market solves every problem. We don't need any trust. And then there's the folks that say we have to regulate everything. Look at the Digital Markets Act. You know, we have to turn everything into a public utility. Uh, same thing for intellectual property. There are people who believe you have to patent everything and other people who believe that you shouldn't patent anything. I think we need to find the right balance uh, and the right balance does involve change to the way we do things, but uh, probably not at either extreme. Yeah, not being extremist is a hard thing in Washington these days, yeah. unfortunately. So, uh, Sam. Yeah, no, I would just build on Richard's point. I, I think he uh, completely agree. I completely agree with his point about that we need pragmatism to take hold. And Rob, not to give you more work for your mission, but I believe business today has no credibility, quite honestly, for lots of reasons. We don't have to go dwell in the past. And academic institutions, I think, are too theoretical. You know, they're not, you don't get the pragmatism that's required that ITIF could bring to this discussion. And there's a lot of education required on the Hill. Uh, I don't know if you can change it, but you can only hope that you can educate them. So at least they know what they're doing when they make their decisions. Great. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Maureen. Uh, so definitely agree uh, with what uh, the, my other fellow panelists have said on, on this point. Um, you know, just really a concern about imposing these kind of outdated models um, where, you know, if we're seeking innovation, um, I'm not sure looking at, you know, old style railroad regulation and <laughs> utilities regulation was a source of innovation. And I don't think it's something that, you know, most consumers would say, boy, I wish things were more like, you know, you know, utility regu regulation, I think. Uh, I think consumers are really sort of being left out of the equation. Um, I, I agree with Rich, though, and, um, uh, you know, others. I, I'm, I'm not a person who says there shouldn't be any antitrust enforcement or, or any regulation. Um, but I think we have to use the right tool for the, for the job. And, Rob, you mentioned a federal privacy law, you know, We've been trying for a long time to get Congress to pass a federal privacy law. And if they have concerns about how data is collected, you share, you know, all of that, I think that's the most obvious tool for that. And I also think some of these proposals actually are very um, um, antithetical to some of the uh, ability of consumers to control their data and, and some of those issues where we start saying, well, you know, these are important assets, so they have to be shared. And, and so I think those raise some key issues there too. So uh, I think, uh, you know, not that there are problems, but we have to think about the right tools to address them. And I think we need to keep consumers' interests more firmly in mind. Great, thank you, Maureen. David, last points. Yes, well, <clears throat> I think it's absolutely critical. We keep innovation front and center not just for economic welfare reasons, but also for geopolitical reasons. And uh, sadly, the debates in Washington and Brussels are really sidelining innovation. I think it's gonna cost not just our economic freedom, but potentially our democracies if we don't change this and get innovation at least, uh, uh, if not center field, then midfield. Great, thank you. Aurelian. Uh... Again, congratulations yes. on the launch of the project today. Um, final words. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob, for giving me this opportunity for the project because precisely as we can hear, as we can see, uh, there's a lot of work to do uh, in order to, how, how, how Maureen has said, to translate Schumpeterian competition and dynamic effect into actionable uh, legal rules and antitrust uh, rules and, and reforms. So I think it's, uh, it's very important to account for Schumpeterian competition. But now the question is, what do we do uh, from that and how can we translate for for law and rules uh, to be more uh, uh, yeah more more aligned with uh, Schumpeterian competition. So we started to do it with a report we just released, but that's a very embryonic uh, move. And I think a lot of 
um, a lot of things to, still to be done in terms of policy and research agenda. So I'm I'm looking forward to to work with with you all on this uh, Schumpeterian project. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, just for the folks who want to know, we've launched that project, and there's a homepage for it with a number of different articles. Uh, and um, please uh, keep checking back and or sign up for our email because you'll see a lot more work in this area. Uh, so I want to thank, first of all, all of you. A great panel today, great panelists, really fantastic insights. Uh, I, I couldn't appreciate you joining us more than that. Uh, and also thanks for all the audience uh, who participated in, and also asked questions. This is going to be uh, recorded and, and put up on our website. So if you want to share it with anybody later, you can do that. So again, thank you very much. Everybody should stay in just for a couple of minutes, just for 10 seconds. Don't log